some perspective from Danielle DiMartino Booth. She's chief executive officer and chief strategist at QI Research and, of course, a former advisor to the Dallas Fed. Danielle, thank you very much uh, for joining us. You've spoken in the recent past about this uh, opposing forces on the U.S. economy. On one hand, we have the U.S. Uh, Fed uh, clearly trying to uh, apply the brakes and, and uh, uh, doing some uh, doing some d damage to the U.S. economy in the in the uh, process, or like likely to do so. On the other hand, on the fiscal side, uh, and I think a lot of Canadians might be surprised to hear this, we have uh, pandemic-style support spending continuing to this day at levels that remain largely unchanged, if I understand correctly, from the worst of the pandemic, and that's uh, of course adding liquidity, uh, adding dollars uh, to the U.S. economy. How, how does this all end? You know, it, it really does remain to be seen. We're seeing acute weakness in areas of the economy that are not benefiting from the $6.7 trillion of spending on a 12-month rate that we've just seen. Let's compare that to the $7.6 trillion that we saw at the peak of the public health emergency. So Uncle Sam is spending it as quick as he possibly can borrow it. You know, the difference is right now, the Federal Reserve is actually reducing its footprint, uh, not just by increasing uh, borrowing rates for the country, but it's also stepping back from its buyer of first resort at treasury auctions. And that means that other buyers are having to, to come to auction and buy this increased uh, amount of debt on the terminal. This morning, we learned that the quarterly, quarterly refunding, uh, according to the treasury department, is going to go up to $104 billion. Um, from 96 billion in longer term notes. So in, in some ways, this is when Fed policy really starts to bite, when U.S. Uh, borrowing costs really are taking up a much larger proportion of the country's budget. Yeah, and you've also referred recently to commercial lending as being, quote, the next shoe to fall. What, what kind of uh, uh, strains do we see there? And what, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, we're seeing bankruptcies uh, being filed here in the United States at the fastest pace since uh, 2009. We are expecting Yellow Trucking, a $5 billion company with 30,000 employees, to file Chapter 7 this morning. Uh, that, would be a, uh, that would be entering into full liquidation. So, you know, we, we are seeing the vestiges of Fed policy play out here in the real economy. We're seeing commercial and industrial lending contracting. We're seeing uh, financing for commercial real estate really dry up. A few weeks ago, I was commenting, you know, it was one or two or every three days or so that you were seeing a, a skyscraper, a large building being handed back to the lender. We, we called it jingle mail dur during the subprime mortgage crisis, but we now reference great big buildings. And now you're seeing these as everyday occurrences where the borrower and, and, and the lender are just too far away in terms of borrowing costs because the Fed's campaign has been as aggressive as it has. You also track uh, and have been tracking quite recently uh, jobless claims. What, what are we seeing there on the, on the employment front? Are we seeing cracks in the very tight labor market? So it's extraordinary. In September of 2022, so not even a year ago, there were no states in the country that had rising ranks of continuing jobless claimants. That, that is, people in any given state who were collecting unemployment benefits. We're now at 46 states. So 93% of the U.S. population is living in a state where there are rising numbers of continuing jobless claimants. And I look, I look at it as being a degree of separation, if you will, and that means that you probably know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who has lost their job. Compound that again with what we're going to see today with yellow trucking, which I, I consider to be more of a headline effect than a macroeconomic event, but it's going to be such a big moment that it's going to capture the, the public's attention and draw more focus on companies that are closing at such a fast pace, much smaller companies, obviously, than, ye than yellow trucking. But we're not really paying attention because the stock market remains so high, it's easy to ignore what's happening on the ground in the U.S. economy. Is the stock market, uh, you know, when people watch their TV screens on the, this channel and the similar channels in the U.S., they see lines moving from the bottom left to the top right. Uh, does that give uh, people a false sense of security about the state of the U.S. economy? It, you know, if it does not, uh, then, then it should. We should step back and pause uh, 
similar times in history when uh, when there's been this broad of a consensus calling for a soft landing. Uh, it didn't matter what the publication was or in what corner of the world you were reading it over the weekend. The consensus right now is, the, is that the U.S. will have a soft landing. We saw similar levels of complacency in 2000 and in 2007. And of course, those episodes don't end very well, but they do give new meaning to the cliche, the, the, the calm before the storm. And I really do think that that's where we are. A lot of our indices don't capture uh, some of the risk in fixed income assets, for example, because a generation ago, when we were headed into the great financial crisis, exchange traded funds that were backed by bonds, to take but one example, they weren't the presence that they are today. So a lot of the metrics that we're looking at, we need to see through the prism of a financial system and the structure of a financial system that's changed greatly in the past, call it 15 years or so. You were asked recently whether you see a U.S. recession coming, and I believe your answer was yes. And one thing you pointed to was the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. Yes, indeed. Uh, so out of, out of 85 uh, indices, this is the broadest metric of the U.S. economy in existence. A lot of people don't reference it because it's it can be a little bit noisy and it is so broad. But of the 85 separate metrics, metrics measured, only 30 of them are going up. A lot of that is being predicated again on the stock market. Same situation, parallel line that you can draw with the conference board's uh, leading economic index. If you net out the effect of the stock market from those 10 indices, indicators. You're seeing that the U.S. economy is slowing at a much, much faster rate. The industrial recession is really starting to bite what's happening in manufacturing outside of the green energy type of um, electric vehicle type of incentives that are being paid for and subsidized by the federal government. Outside of that, we really are feeling the brunt of the slowdown here in our industrial sector, which is being amplified by what we're seeing. And we saw fresh data overnight coming out of China and that reopening trade not being strong enough to bolster the rest of the global economy, as was the case in 2015-16, and, and of course in 2009, the Chinese government is not spending as much to help out the rest of the global economy as it has in our most prior cycles. Uh, why don't we finish with the U.S. banking system? Uh, investors uh, believe when, you know, to resume to the, the buoyant stock market, investors clearly believe that the, uh, the worst is over and, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the strains on the U.S. regional banks may be over after the quick action from regulators back in March and April. Uh, do you see that situation as re resolved? Well, I, I certainly don't. Um, last week, we had a forced marriage between two uh, West Coast banks. And then on Friday, of course, we, ha we had FDIC uh, Friday Failure Day. We had a small bank in, in, in Kansas go. And I suspect that the FDIC is going to be very methodical, but go about its way closing one bank after another. They might not be great, big, splashy First Republic or Silicon Valley banks. But nonetheless, we know that small and community banks are up to their eyeballs in commercial real estate assets, which was not the case in prior cycles. So we know that that risk lies for them and that we will continue to see bank closures in America. 